Uh, let's just pray. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I thank you, Father, your spirit is here. And Lord, I just uh, pray that um, you would reveal it, Father, as it was revealed to me. And um, thank you for all the confirmations, Lord, that, uh, and Lord, it always first begins with me, because it's something in me that I have to work through as well. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. We, I, I promise you, it's not going to be boring. Um, let me give you some confirmation to this thing right real quick, though, because um, we're going to talk about uh, the eyes a little bit um, in a different way, though. I'm going to show you. Um, Joe and Madge called me up, I mean, and, and talking about to me about Samson, you know. Samson had his eyes gouged out. That was one. Uh, yesterday, while me and my brother was working, um, he was hitting the eye with a piece of metal right here, and actually, um, he was... Uh, using a hammer and prying a nail out but hitting the back end of another hammer oh. and a piece broke off and hit him in the eye and it cut him and he was bleeding from his right eye um, not and I'm the eyeball. not the eyeball I mean right next to the lid right here Almost but if it would have went it would have went into the eye but it's you know the eyelid it was on the eyelid so it's still eye yeah. um, and um, you know this week Thursday and he came back Friday when I was going through my message um, Friday I was sitting in my house um, you know uh, Thursday I had a visual eye inspection of my house that you know before I could close the walls up you know and one thing he saw that you know I needed to do was I didn't realize that you had to have three inch plate washers on a bottom plate and that was the only thing he told me. He said, look, he said, uh, I'm not going to fail you, but he said, I am going to put it on hold and I'll come back tomorrow if you go get the, the washers right now. Well, those washers, I had to get 50 of them. They cost $100 just for washers wow. on a bottom plate, you know, and I had washers on it already. So it was a visual inspection that, you know, I had to go through um, along while this message is actually coming forth. And Cherie had called me and she was telling me about uh, this mule she wants to get. She said, it's really not eye pleasing, but man, this thing is a beast and it'll, you know, it's the best rod and it's got more power than any horse she's ever rode. And, um, but we can get into that um, later. So all of this stuff with the eyes, you know, was coming out. And, and then Brother Joe says, he's praying for, you know, I pray that you have your uh, a Damascus experience where Paul was, you know, blinded. Saul was blinded, you know, with his eyes. And there was just all kind of stuff. So I want to take you down a little road. And um, it's going to be a little different, but uh, let's see. Get into some interesting things at first before the message actually comes forth. Um, you know, I'm going to give you a little comparison between Moses uh, and Jesus, Yeshua, all right? Amen. Um, there's some amazing things that are in it. So let's just check out a couple of things. I'm going to talk about a couple of the arcs, you know, in the Bible. I'm going to talk about Noah's Ark. I'll talk about uh, the Ark of Bulrushes that Moses was put in. And I'm going to talk about the Ark of the Covenant and see what we can see in this stuff. But real quick... Um, Moses, um, it says that, um, you know, turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2. I'm going to read this. And there's some things I want you to take notice to. It's going to help us in a, in a huge way. Exodus chapter 2. You really are going to be like, wow, it's amazing. God is amazing. His word. Exodus chapter 2, and I'm going to read uh, Exodus chapter 2, verse 1 through 11. Um, it says, And there went a man of the house of Levi, 
and took to wife a daughter of Levi, and Levi means joined. Um, and the woman conceived and bare a son, and when she saw him, uh, that he was a goodly child, she hid him for about three months. And that goodly means he was beautiful. He was a good-looking kid. Um, it says that he was a, a goodly child. She hid him three months. And when she could no longer hide him, she took him uh, for him an ark of bulrushes and dabbed it with slime and pitch and put the child therein. And she laid it in the flags by the riverbanks. And his sister stood afar off, that would be Miriam when she was young, stood afar off to witness what would be done of him, what would happen to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh, the daughter of Pharaoh, came down to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along by the river's side. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrew children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, this would be Miriam, Shall I go and fetch and call uh, to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Go, and the maid went, and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto the child, said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. Wow, she's being paid to raise Moses, her own son. That's, they got some stuff up in there. And the woman took the child and nursed it. So he was nursed under his mother. And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter and became her son. And she called his name Moses. In Hebrew, it would be Moshe. In Egyptian, it would be Masha. And she said, because I have drew him out of the water. Uh, and it came to pass in those days, and I, I'm going to stop right there. One through, uh, chapter 2, 1 through 11. Um, it, yeah, let me go, so I'm going to read verse 11. Um, and it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens, and he uh, spied an Egyptian smiting in Hebrew one of his brethren. So Moses knew he was an Egyptian. I mean, he was, a, he was Hebrew. He was raised by his mother. So he was trained, you know, not by Egypt. It's when you get your children, they young is when you instill. They say, you know, from three to six years old is where they, they gonna, it's going to be able to tell where they absorb the most. Thank you, Mama. And, um, but I want to just make a comparison and, and show you something. Moses' name, um, she, she named him Moses, which is uh, Masha or Moshi, and, um, because it means to draw out. She, he was drawn out of the waters. Now, Jesus, it talks about Yeshua or Jesus, um, he is, uh, it says that we're to draw out of the wells of salvation. So the only way that we can receive is by drawing out, okay? Moses was drawn out of the river. Um, in order to receive, we actually draw out of the word of God. And so I want to make a, a little uh, comparison for you. Check this out. Number one, we find that Moses was beautiful. But Jesus was uncomely, right? I hate to say ugly, but he was uncomely to look upon, right? So for the eye to look at, at Moses, she noticed instantly the first thing she saw that he was beautiful in the sight. Now I'm going to tell you another thing. Um, it says he was placed in an ark. This beautiful baby was placed in an ark of bulrushes, which is papyrus, okay? Moses is placed inside of it in Exodus chapter 2, verse 1 through 11. And now I want to go and I want to read Acts chapter 7, because this will uh, begin to tie some things in. Just let me lay the groundwork for you, and I, I, guarantee, I, I promise you it's going to get very, very interesting. Acts chapter 7, and this is Stephen. 
right before they stone him. Verse 17 through 39. 17 through 39. Um, and it says, But when the time of promise had drew nigh, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, till another king arose that knew not Joseph. The same dwelt, uh, the same dealt with subtility, craftiness with our kindred, and evil entreated of our fathers, so that they cast out their young children to the end that they might not live. In which time Moses was born, and was exceedingly fair, and nourished up in his father's house for three months. He was brought up. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her, her own son. Notice how Moses is cast out of his father's house. He's cast out. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in words and in deeds. Wow. And when he was a full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel, and seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote, um, and smote an Egyptian. I want to show you some things about Moses. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God, by his hand, would deliver them. But they understood not. Moses already thinks that God is going to raise him up to deliver the people. Wow. Right? He wasn't even called yet. He didn't even get to Mount Sinai. But he's thinking it's going to be delivered by his own strength and his own power. So he had plans to deliver his people. Right? Moses had plans to deliver the people. The law had plans to deliver the people, right? And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, ye are brethren, why ye do this wrong one to another? But he that did this, uh, uh, his neighbor wrong, thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Wilt thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Then Moses fled at this saying, and was a stranger in the land of Midian, where he begat two sons. And when he was, a, uh, and when he was forty years um, were expired, there appeared unto him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire. And when Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight, and as he drew near, he beheld it, the voice of the Lord came to him, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses trembled, and he did not say, he, he, dust, uh, um, he dared not to look. Then said the Lord unto him, Put off thy shoes uh, from thy feet, for the place where thou art stand, where standest is holy ground. I have seen, and I have seen the affliction of my people, which is in Egypt, and I have heard their groanings, and I have come down to deliver them, and now come I, will I send thee to Egypt. This Moses, whom they refuse, uh, Stephen is saying, uh, who made thee a ruler and a judge, the same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out after that he had uh, showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, liken unto me him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness. In the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in Mount Sinai, and with our fathers who received the living oracles uh, that God had given to us, to whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turned back to Egypt. So, um, this is all about God calling Moses in the Moses being beautiful and what they see and, and Stephen is, is just bringing them back. Um, he's talking to the Pharisees and Sadducees and bringing them back to, he's trying to um, show them that Jesus is the promised Messiah. So let me um, read a few things to you. Kind of laid uh, 
so you, you understand where I'm coming from. Um, the ark is made of bulrushes or papyrus. And Moses is beautiful, and he's placed inside this ark. Um, we just read that. In verse 20, it says that uh, he was exceedingly fair. He was good-looking. In Exodus, it says he was, uh, he was goodly. In the Hebrew Strong's 2896, it actually gives the word tob, T-O-B. So Moses was actually, he, was, he looked good, and he was desirable. He was pleasing. This is from the Hebrew Strong's Concordance. He is pleasing in one sight. Moses is pleasing in one sight. He's beautiful, the outside image of Moses. But he's placed inside of an ark of bulrushes made of papyrus. It says, um, and I looked up bulrushes here, and it says that, um, that, um, an arc of bulrushes is actually, it's um, uh, the arc being made of bulrushes. Bulrushes is actually, um, uh, it's, um, oh. in verse 5 it says it's, I, I, what I'm trying to do is, let me just kind of give you a heads up. I have a scripture here I don't want to read, and I want to fit it in at the end. So I got to see how I'm going to put this together right here. I need to read this at the end. But anyway, the ark is made of bulrushes. And bulrushes are known for humility, bowing. So this ark that, this, that it, he's made out of, that Moses, something beautiful that's placed in, the ark is made of bulrushes. And bulrushes are known for bending. It's known for humility. Okay. It says, in Exodus chapter 2, verse 3, it says, it was dabbed with slime and with pitch. So this ark is not pretty, but its, its outer form is humility. And beauty is on the inside, not on the outside. Okay? So uh, slime, in the Hebrew Strong's 2564, it just means tar. It's used in waterproofing. So it was waterproofed. And um, it refers uh, to a word um, which is zapet, which means resin. It just means to waterproof something. And it's derived from uh, the word zigot, which means a flaming torch. Chains or fetters or a firebrand. Now, what I'm trying to say is, this is how they built this thing. They took um, bulrushes, they pitched it with tar and slime, they put fire to it, which helped seal it, just giving you the makeup of this boat. Um, and it has a reference to, uh, to hold back, to restrain, or to reframe. So it's just waterproof that this boat is. It's not goodly to look upon but the beauty was on the inside of this boat that's made, okay? Um, this is how the ark of bulrushes was made. The outside was not pretty, but the beauty was on the inside. Um, I want to tell you another thing. Noah, it says that when Noah was born, Noah was, in the book of Enoch, was an albino. He was snow white. His hair was long, you know. He was snow white. In fact, when he was born, you know, uh, his father, Methus um, Lamech, went back to Methuselah and Enoch and was like, what's going on? You know, the son that I've had, I'm afraid of, he's solid white. You know, it, it, they never seen it before. But Noah was a picture of Christ. And Noah built the ark made of acacia, right? Acacia wood or shittim wood. And he pitched it within and without. So the outside of Noah's ark was not pleasing to the eye. That wasn't what it was about. It was what was on the inside that mattered, that counted, right? So to look at the ark of Moses... It wasn't, I mean, in Egypt, there was, I mean, these were the master boat builders, right? 
Now, you know, Moses' mom just runs down and gets these reeds and makes this, you know, this slum pitch looking thing that she placed Moses inside of. You know, this vessel he was placed inside of. Just like Noah, who was solid white and albino. Now, remember in Revelations, the Bible says that Jesus was, you know, um, his hair was white like wool. Noah's hair was white like wool. He was clothed in the robe of, of, of righteousness, white, all the way down to his foot. Right? That's Jesus. And Noah is a type of Christ whose name means rest, that he's inside uh, an ark. Right? That's not pretty on the outside. Inside of a vessel that doesn't, you know, look so good. So, let me tell you a little bit about Moses. Um, Moses was a Levite from the family line, but from the family line of Aram and Jochbed. Okay? Aram means high and exalted one. So Moses is from a family of Jochbed and Aram, which means highly exalted or high exalted. Amen. Right? Um, this is in Exodus chapter 16, verse 18 and 20, and Numbers 26, verse 58 and 59. Moses, he leaves his family uh, of their, their, um, their lineages, their lineage, just the name is highly, high and exalted. God takes him and places him in Egypt as a prince. Now he's a, another place of exaltation. Right? Then check this out. When Moses flees from Egypt, he goes to the house of, uh, of Jethro, which is a, a, a Midianite priest. Now he's in another house that's elevated. Amen. A priest of Midian, who, where he marries his daughter, which is, you know, so it's showing you, you know, just showing you in, in how... Um, this uh, Moses being drawn out, separated, you know, to a position that's highly exalted. Amen. Um, it says, but check this out. Um, Moses, which represented the law, he's born into slavery. Moses is born in slavery. That's right. Right? The law is slavery. Watch. Watch this. Watch. Because remember, the law is what opens the eye. They notice the beauty of Moses. But Moses is placed in a boat that's ugly. But what did Moses, or who did Moses, or who did Stephen say, For God shall raise up a prophet like unto myself, him shall ye hear. Right? Amen. I hate to say it, but guess what? Mary was ugly. I'm sorry. Listen, watch. I'm going to show you why. Okay. Mary was not a good looking woman. And I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to prove it to you why she was not a good looking woman. It was for a reason. You know it says beauty is in the eye of the beholder? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Watch this. The law opens your eyes to what's ugly or pretty. Watch. It says, um, Moses was born into slavery. The law is slavery. But he was nurtured by his mother in his early years, then raised in royalty, he was learned, in all the cups, customs of Egypt. Then, after 40 years, he flees to Midian, where he becomes a shepherd and the son-in-law of a Midianite priest, Jethro, where he marries a Gentile bride named Zipporah. Wow. He marries a Gentile bride. Right? Right? And where he has two sons. The first son is Gershom, meaning exile. 
That is reminding him of his exile out of Egypt. To be exiled is to be cast away. To be casted out. Like the Bible says, Satan was cast, exiled out of heaven. His first son he named Gershom, to reminding him of his exile. His second son he named Eleazar because God was his help. That was the two sons that he had from his wife, whose name was Zipporah, Zipporah. And Zipporah means bird. Now the Bible says the fowls of the air are unclean. So she's a Gentile. She's unclean. So Moses, who was a, a picture of Jesus Christ, actually married a Gentile woman, which Miriam mocked him for. Right? Wow, his sister. And what happened? She became white as snow, a leper in her flesh. I mean, watch this. Also, at the giving of the covenant, it says, um, when God gave Moses the covenant, it says that he becomes a bloody bridegroom to Sephora. Remember? When God gave him the law of circumcision, he didn't follow it. God was about to kill him. But Zipporah, Zipporah circumcised her son, Gershom. Wow. Check that one out. Amen. Zipporah and slung the flesh at him. That's right. Cut away the flesh because it's not the outer appearance. It's what's on the inside. Yeah. There's a cutting away of the flesh. She slung it at him and said, you have become a bloody bridegroom to me. That's right. That's what Jesus Christ is to us. Our bloody bridegroom that saved us from the law of the flesh. <laughs> Wait. Watch. The Bible says that he was slow of speech and slow of tongue in Exodus 4, verse 10. But in Exodus chapter 2, it says he was mighty in words and deeds. That don't sound like a speech impediment to me. But if you know anything about Moses, the boat that he was placed in was a boat of humility. And the Bible says he was the most humblest man in the Bible. He wasn't an outspoken person. In fact, he didn't even like to confront things. Kind of sound like Jesus? Doesn't Jesus say for us to control a tongue and slow it down? Slow it down. So, I wrote, I believe that he was just humble and full of humility and was not confrontational. Just wasn't a confrontation. That's who God looks to use. You think God used Moses because he was confrontational? No. He used him because he wasn't confrontational. Amen. The Bible says, be a peacemaker. Be humble. Don't be around a, a, a brawler, one who runs his mouth all the time. Listen more. Two ears and one mouth. Talk less. Come on. Amen. We get so used to shooting off our mouth. I believe Moses, he's placed in an ark. He's placed inside of an ark of humility. And was, he was not confrontational. He's trying to make peace between his brethren. Brethren, why are you fighting? Does that sound like a brawler? No, a brawler's like, hit him! Hit, him. hit that son of a gun! He's not a brawler. He's a peacemaker. Amen. That's what I was taught to be. Pursue peace with your brethren at all costs. Before your brethren takes you to the courts, 
and before the judge and have you put in prison. He says, and Jesus also, and Jesus also was slow to speak. He was. Yeah, he ripped it on the Pharisees and Sadducees a couple of times. But he, that wasn't his nature. It's when they thought they knew it and they confronted him. It says that he even uttered not a word in the courts. Remember? Remember Moses said, Oh Lord, I'm slow of speech and of tongue. And God was aggravated with him. He didn't ask the Lord to heal his tongue. Heal my tongue. No. He said, let my brother. Oh, God said, get your brother because you don't want to say nothing. You're fully capable. I called you. Look, use your brother. He'll do it. God was aggravated with him. Right? Man, so many times in my life, I'm just not a confrontational person. I see things and I just, you know, won't you say something? Nah, I'm just going to let it go. You know, and it aggravates people. You know? But I believe we need to just, you know, it's better to keep our mouth shut because you'll find out your mouth gets you in trouble. How many times has your mouth gotten you in trouble? So, the story of Moses after the ten plagues that befell Egypt, they're set free by the tenth plague, right? The death of the firstborn. They're set free. They leave Egypt in the fourth watch, being saved by the blood then baptized in the sea unto Moses and unto that rock that did follow them. The church in the wilderness, remember? Baptized unto Moses. Let me tell you something. That's not the baptism of the law because the law hadn't even been given yet. They didn't receive it till they got to the mountain. They were set free by the, by the blood and they was baptized unto Jesus, the rock that followed them. You don't believe me? Read 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Wow. And God laid waste of them in the wilderness because they didn't believe Him. Salvation before the law. Before the law. They are set free before the law was even given. So they was not baptized in the law, but unto the grace of the rock that followed them. From here, Moses leads them. Moses leads them to God. Moses leads them to God. What am I saying? Moses, who is Moses? Moses is given, is the one who is given us, ask any Jewish man, we have Moses. Moses give us Torah. Yes. Moses leads them to God. Torah leads you to God. Torah leads you to Jesus. The Torah, the Word of God, leads you to Jesus. And Jesus is the only one that can cross us over. Period. That's what the giving of the law was for, to lead us to Jesus. Jesus did what the law couldn't do. In fact, the Bible says the law of God is perfect and holy. But, Paul said, finding fault in the people, God had to change his covenant. He did not find fault in the Torah. He found fault in the people that they couldn't keep it. So he had to give them another covenant. (laughs) The same law of faith that set them free from Egypt. The blood and the water. And these two agree as one. The Torah will never set you free. It'll only point you to the one 
that can set you free. The Torah leads us to God by faith. Dot, dot, dot. Here we see salvation given unto God's chosen people before the law is even given to Moses. Here is where we see the next ark. But this ark is beautiful like was Moses. Wow! The first ark was ugly. Noah built an ark, but beauty was on the inside. The second ark that God builds or is built. But Moses' mother is ugly. But the beauty is on the inside. Now, the Levite lineage was beautiful people. But guess what? Jesus was of the lion of the tribe of Judah. And so was his mother. Now hold on a second here. Jesus is of the lion of the tribe of Judah. I remember Jacob had four wives. Well, he had two wives, two concubines, Jacob. Jacob looked on the beauty of Rachel. Right? He loved Rachel, but Leah, she was ugly. In fact, in order to marry Leah, she had to be in a dark room with her head covered. And Jacob didn't even know what he was doing. He thought he had the wrong, he thought he had Rachel in there. But he really had Leah. Wow. You see, Jacob is looking with the eye, but God is looking in the heart, the inside. And Leah bore six sons and one daughter. And her daughter was Dinah. Right? The fourth son was Judah. Leah was ugly. And it was through Judah came the Messiah. Don't even try to tell me that Mary looked like Mary on Jesus of Nazareth. Oh, pretty. Oh, the mother. No, that cat wasn't good looking, nor was Jesus. Because God didn't want you looking on the outside. God doesn't want us looking on the outside. He wants us to see what's on the inside. What's inside Noah's Ark? A man. His hair is white as snow. He's white from head to toe. What come out of Noah's ark is a man whose name means rest. And Jesus Christ is our rest. He was pure white, the book of Enoch says. He was a picture of Christ because the beauty was on the inside. The vessel that was prepared for him, for Noah, was ugly on the outside. The vessel that was prepared for Moses, who was a type of Christ and beautiful, the boat or the vessel or the skin covering or whatever the vessel was, was ugly on the outside. The beauty is always on the inside. Amen. Wow. Yeah. But wait, the third ark, when the law is given, requires the outside to be beautiful. Because when they built the tabernacle of Moses, the Ark of the Covenant was solid gold on the outside. Beautiful. Whoa. The law required perfection. That's what the law requires. You look at people and judge people according to what you see with your eye and demand or require perfection out of that person. That's law. 
In fact, the tabernacle or tent skin that they traveled around with in the wilderness was overlaid with, you know, um, with uh, ram skins dyed red and badger skins, which were seal skins, which were uncomely. And the beauty of all of that was in the inside. The gold, everything inside of that tabernacle. But the outside was not pretty. But when the law came forth, the law had the eyes open and the law required that, you know, it's got to be beautiful. It's got to be the best. Let me tell you so what happened. I'm at my house and I'm building my house and man, I love the way it's coming out. And the inspector came over Thursday. And all he could do was talk about the house. Man, how beautiful the house was on the outside. And we, he, he got into it so much he wanted to build one like it. I'm telling you. He said, man, this is exactly what I want my house to look like. I love the cabin stop. Man, this is amazing. I, man. And he sat there and bragged on a house, the outside of the house, for 15 minutes. He forgot to do an inspection on my panel. He was getting in the truck. I said, hey, you're going to check the panel? Oh, my Lord. He said, I got so wrapped up in what, the house, I forgot about the panel. But the inspector came into my house and he wanted to inspect it. Wow. Inspection. To see if anything is wrong. Isn't that something? That's what I, I'm just happened, right? I'm working with my brother yesterday. He's working, bam, 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 bam. A thing hits him in the eye. I said, ah, another confirmation. An inspection. I remember I was working at the zoo. And, you know, I wasn't right. Got this girl come walking down. I even told my wife this. Young lady. She passed me every day. She was good looking. And I, I'm, I'm working on the deck, and I've said to the Lord, I ain't looking today. I ain't looking at her when she passes, Lord. I ain't looking at this girl when she passes me. And I started cutting, the, the, I started cutting with the skill saw across the board. And when she walked right there, I just took a quick glance. I looked up like that. Pow! I got hit in the eye with a big old chip. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> the Bible says if you're... That was my right eye. The Bible... What's that? That's right, and the, and the Lord spoke, I was about to say it, and the Lord spoke a scripture to me, he said, if your right eye offends you, gouge it out. That's right. Because if I don't gouge it out, my wife will. But let me tell you, that was a process. You know, that was definitely a process. You know, and I'm going to tell you another thing. That's why Paul had to be blinded before he could be used by God. Because Paul was into the physical inspection deal. Let me keep going. Got me off track now. Yes. I don't know if you remember. Remember the day before yesterday? I had, you had, to, or that morning, you had to get off the phone with your brother because my time passed and my right eye was blind. Oh, I helped you get the contact out of your right eye. eye that, she called me. I, I, she was outside. Come help me. Come help me. I got my contacts rolled back in my eye. It was, her, it was her right eye. I actually helped her get her contact. These are how God will confirm a message to you. So that was one confirmation. The, and, oh, I was telling you about the inspector. So after he inspects and everything, he leaves. He says, look, the only thing you have to do is put some plate washers on the bottom. I'll come back tomorrow. So Friday, you know, I don't do anything on Friday. I shut everything down in... Uh, I sit down at my table and I get with the Lord. So I'm sitting down at the table inside of the house when the inspector walks in. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I got an opportunity here. The Bible's all laid out. I know he's going to ask me a question. You know, maybe God, Lord, open a door. So he walks in and um, he said, hey, you got those washers on? I said, yeah, I sure did. I said, you can walk around and check them out. He said, oh, I believe you. And I said, well, if you want to check, you can. And so he kind of glanced around and, and um, he said, uh, what's, what you doing? I said, well, I'm reading my word. I passed through a little church, you know. And um, he said, yeah. He said, uh, 
I, uh, my mama likes to read and stuff like that. He said, but man, I just, I don't have time for all. I got so much going on. I got kids with football and this and that. And he said, maybe in about three years or so, you know, um, when my kids are a little bit grown up a little bit more, I'll be able to get into it. You know, I said, um, I said, brother, now is the time. I mean, you can make time right now. He said, yeah, but I'm really busy. I'm always in a truck. I said, look, you can get you some CDs and put them in your truck. And while you drive all over the place, you can, they got drama to, dramalization version now. You can listen to the word. And he said, ah, maybe so. You know, uh, you know I'm just, uh, it's really, uh, you know, it's just not for me right now. Maybe in about three years or so. I said, look, you know, on Saturdays I have church right here at the RV park. Come over on Saturdays. Ah, man, I got so much stuff going on on Saturdays. And, and he said, oh, you know, I just ain't got time. I said, well, see about getting those CDs. And, and he left. You know, he missed it. He was, he was more blown away by the outside of the house. Rather, what was on the inside of the house. I wasn't worried about the outside of the house. Yeah, it's okay and it looks good, but I want the inside of the house to be far better than what the outside looks like. And what I mean by that is, you know, I put a Bible in the slab. A King James, brand spanking new. When you step in my door, you're stepping on a brand new King James Bible that's in the slab. That's my foundation. It's Jesus Christ. It's what's on the inside. I was trying to reveal to him what's on the inside but he was more concerned about what was on the outside because he didn't have eyes to see the Torah leads us to God by faith here we see salvation given unto God's chosen people before the laws even given to Moses here is where we see the next ark but this ark is beautiful remember you know the law opens the eyes wide that's what it does like was Moses, the ark was beautiful. Like was Moses beautiful. You see? Did you know that if a Levite had any kind of informality, they could not serve as a priest? God said they were not allowed into his service as a priest in his house. A Levite would have to remove all his clothes for a visual inspection to see if there were any imperfections in order to serve as a priest in the house of God. Wow. The law opens wide the eyes to see if they meet your approval. I wonder if the uncomeliness of Jesus would ever attract you and me. I wonder if the uncomeliness of Jesus would have ever attracted you and me. It's easy to be drawn to someone who looks good. I guarantee it they was drawn to Moses. But God chose a vessel for him, a tabernacle that looked like the first arcs that were built. They were uncomely, and they were uncomely for a reason. Because God didn't want us looking for something that was beautiful on the outside. He wants us looking on the inside. It says, wow, the law opens wide the eyes. That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Remember, they noticed they were naked. The law demands that you stand in front of them. People, um, you know, I don't like this. I'm going to do this. And you know, I don't want you to see me because of the way I look. You know, it's the society in which we live. You know, I tell my wife all the time, I don't care what you look like, I love you like you are. You know, um, scars don't bother me, rolls don't bother me, I just hang on. <laughs> Can I say that? They don't bother me. My wife don't have to be ashamed. I'm not perfect, she's not perfect, nor is anyone in here. I wonder if the uncomeliness of Jesus would ever attracted you and me. Jacob had eyes for Rachel, but of her beauty, and of her beauty. But Leah uh, was rejected. 
and she's the one that brought forth the Messiah. Rachel was barren. Wow. Representing the law. The law can't produce fruit. You realize that? The law cannot produce fruit. It is barren. So was the other six women that in the Bible that represented the law. Remember? They were all barren until the Spirit of the Lord. Samson, his mother. Samson representing Jesus. Right? But his failures, we know, was in his eyes. Right? Samson's father was Manoah. His mother was, was barren. And she prayed that God would touch her. And she would have a son, a Nazarite, that would judge the land. That's what Jesus will do when he returns, judge the land. Jesus was of Nazareth, a Nazarene. Right? And here we see Samson's eyes gouged out because of his failure. But his strength is restored unto him in the end. That he kills more in his death than he did in life. And that's what Jesus did. Let me keep going. I'm almost done. Um, for Rachel, uh, Jacob had eyes for Rachel because of her beauty. But Leah, had, he rejected. Rachel was barren, representing the law. Leah was fruitful, having six sons and a daughter, the fourth being Judah, through which the Messiah came. I bet Mary wasn't a looker, seeing her lineage of women wasn't too eye-appealing. I'm sorry, she didn't look like the Mary and Jesus of Nazareth. The ark or the vessel that God had chose uh, to place his son Jesus in looked much like and uh, much like the uncomeliness of his mother or the ark of bulrushes or the ark of Noah in which was made of acacia or shittim. And in the Hebrew Strongs, 7848, it's called shit the trees that it was made of, Noah's Ark. Um, it was not known for its appearance. It wasn't pretty. In fact, they really don't know. They got in a, they show you a, uh, like a, a tree right now that grows in a desert, they think. But I'm not really sure. Because, you know, the beams, it just doesn't get big enough. You know, God had destroyed the earth and all of that stuff. But it's known for its inner strength. That's what it's known for. Shittim or acacia, uncorruptible. This is Christ. Doesn't look good, but known for the inner strength. This also was pitched with slime as well as the ark of Moses was. How easy it is to open wide the eyes and judge the vessel of others that God has made for them. One of the worst is how we even judge ourselves because according to the eyes of this world, if you don't pass their inspection, well, you're just an unworthy, unwanted vessel that is discarded and thrown away. We judge ourselves too harshly. Oh, I don't like this and I don't like that. Yeah, I understand. But when it interferes with who you are, there's a problem. God knows. That's why Paul wrote, it's not the plaiting of the hair or the adorning or the things that you wear. These are all things that the law demanded to show a difference one between another. It's their inner the meekness, the gentleness that's, that, that draws people. Because you'll find out, I don't care how sexy someone is or how handsome somebody is, they could be just as, they could be, you know, uh, picture perfect on the outside, but get to know them on the inside. You don't even want to be around them. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And I'm going to tell you something. If you meet someone that's not so good looking and you would never even think of having a relationship with that person because they're ugly. If they're a friend of yours for a while, they get pretty as it goes on. They usually have the best. They like kind of like grow on you. Like, and everybody else is like, I can't believe she married him. He is ugly. But you know what? When you get to know the person, even their face changes on the inside. I mean, it's just 
It's true. Yeah. <laughs> so we judge ourselves, you know, way too hard. But may I bring you to this one remembrance. That it was the field of broken... Let me go back. How easy it is to open wide the eyes and judge the vessel of others that God has made for them. One of the worst is how we even judge ourselves because according to the eyes of this world, if you don't pass inspection, well, you're just an unworthy, unwanted vessel. It is discarded and then thrown away. But may I bring you to this one remembrance that it was the field of broken, unwanted vessels that Jesus purchased with His love. He went after the treasure in the field. The field of the unwanted, the broken. It's the field that He purchased. Silver and gold will buy you perfection. And when one is paying for it, it, he always wants the best and demands the best just like the law. When you pay for it, the law requires a payment. Jesus paid it all, not some. But the one thing that silver and gold cannot buy is true love. You see, to receive love, you have to sow love. If you want to work in the field that Jesus is working in, He is in the field of the broken pottery, picking up the pieces of broken lives, castaways, imperfect vessels that the law says is not fit for its service. The requirement for serving in this field requires a labor, a labor, and I got it, parentheses, of not demanding perfection or any other thing you may see that is unpleasing to you, but instead will look past the imperfection to the beauty that God has created and is creating on the inside. Only blind people can enter into the fields of God. Only blind people, like Paul, you have to remove the law. You have to remove your judgment because the field that he's working in is a field that's not pretty. It isn't a big building, beautiful church that people want to be a part of and build. It's the places that doesn't look so good. The places that are unattractive, where nobody wants to go where nobody wants to build a church. They want to build a church in Metairie or build a church in Mandeville, in Covington, where the money is, where the beautiful houses are, where they can reap silver and gold and build big, beautiful buildings. Stop judging people by what you see. Only blind people can enter into the service of God. I wrote here, help me, Lord, and I'm closing. Help me, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. amen. Jesus talked about the whitewashed sepulchers and on the inside, dry men's bones, dead bones. The beautiful churches we see. I'm going to read Isaiah chapter 58, and I'm going to close, 1 through 14. 
Isaiah 58. And I'm done. Isaiah 58. You know, this message is uh, more than, you know, it's, uh, it's helping me in a, in, in a way of I need to trust the Lord more because it's not everything we see, you know. God is at work. The blessings of true worship. Let's see what true worship is. True worship. Cry out loud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Jacob was a looker. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest not knowledge? Why haven't you looked? We're doing, we're fasting, we're doing this. Behold, in the day of your fast ye find pleasure, and exact all your labors. Behold, ye fast for strife and debate, and to smite with the fist of the wickedness. Ye shall not fast as they do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. Listen to this now. Is it such a fast that I have chosen? A day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head like a bulrush? Wow. And to spread sackcloth and ashes unto him? Will thou call this a fast? and an acceptable uh, day to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I have chosen? What is a fast? It's to deny yourself of things maybe you see that look good and pleasing and all of, you know, it's to deny self. Is not this the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of the wickedness to undo the heavy burdens and to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry and, to, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out into thy house? These are the broken and the bruised and the, these are the ones that Jesus is interested in. It's not these ones that are up at the top building these big buildings that are dressed in fancy clothes and what we see today. God is saying, you're calling that a fast. But I'm telling you, that's not. You didn't separate yourself from anything. You're not laboring in anything. Labor in my field. The sick, the battered, the broken, the bruised. The ugly ones. Build your churches there. Then I will take notice of you, says the Lord. Amen. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and thou bring the poor that are cast out into thy house? When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. Wow. Hide not thyself from thy own flesh. Meaning people. Don't hide yourself from them that are, you know, you know is having a hard time. If you can help them, help them. Because I'm telling you, you ain't going to receive nothing of God if you don't. That's His field. Amen. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thy health spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy re-reward, thy guard, rear guard. Then shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he will say, Here am I. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and the speaking vanity. These guys are spitting the law. Rejected. That's why the peasants lived outside of the city. Of Jerusalem, only the rich live there. And if thou draw, draw out thy soul to the hungry, 
and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall the light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness will be as the noonday. And the Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought and make, the, make fat thy bones. And thou shalt be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters will not fail. And they shall be of thee, and they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Potter's field was a wasted place. But God has called us to build that field. Wow. Totally opposite of everything that we do. We don't build a house in the ghettos, but that's where God builds His house. You can infect some people there, change some lives. I'm guilty. But we need to think differently. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. They shall raise up the foundations of many generations. And thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the paths to dwell in. Remember the parable of the Good Samaritan? The priest and the Levite looked at them and went their own way. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure, on, if you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord honorable, and shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thy own words, what is that talking about? Jesus said, I am your Sabbath. Where did he say that at? That's the rest. That's the Sabbath that he is talking about keeping. Not the seventh day Sabbath. It's the law of Jesus. Come unto me, all you who labor in our heavy lading, and I will give you Sabbath. Rest. That's the rest. For my yoke is easy. The law's yoke is not easy. And my burden is light. Amen. The law is bondage. Jesus Christ is freedom. Amen. And you'll find him working in the fields of poverty, stricken lives. I'm sorry to say, if he was here today, he wouldn't be in the churches, the mega churches. He wouldn't even go there. I'm sorry. When you pay $68 million for a plane, that you think you deserve. When you build multi-million dollar sepulchers that are filled with dead men's bones Amen. and call it a house of God, the house of God that he built, his government institution, was to feed the poor and the widow and take care of the orphan so that they would have meat on his table. Shalt thou honor him by doing your own ways? Verse 14, Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to rot upon the high places of the earth. You see, First, humility, then exaltation. The law requires exaltation. We are separated from all of you, right? Even the priests amongst the brethren of the Levites were battling, 
right? Korah, the Levite cousin of Moses. Why can't we go in and serve God? It's a battle. We want to be recognized. I wanted to be a big time evangelist. I wanted to build, you know, a big church. Thank God for humility. And no money. And a small church. Before you can have exaltation. You have a have an understanding of what humility is. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Father, in Jesus' name, your word is true, it's pure, and it's holy. Father, help us to not judge according to what we see with the eyes, Lord. Blind us all, Lord, to see what you see inside of people. Help us, Lord, Lord, to, um, to do your will and to work in your field, Father. Lead us and guide us, Father. Thank you for your word. Forgive me. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.